Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. <laughs> We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. This is a very special episode of Double Feature. My name is Eric, and returning uh, to the show today is Michael Kester. Hey, glad to be back. Happy to see everybody. To answer for Ghostbusters. What? What do you mean we, answer? Oh yeah, that's right. We got some. We got some emails about. See, apparently you don't get these messages. I don't. I don't know. I've been bombarded this week with people who usually I save this for the year end, which means it's not that important, so I forget about it and we never talk about it. Yeah, see, I get bombarded with Facebook friend requests. So these people want to be your friends? They the want to be my friends, people are yelling at me yeah. about Ghostbusters? Yeah, that's the difference you between said you it. and I. You came on our show and you said something uh, that I still find no fault in. Okay. Uh, I said something about Ghostbusters being popular. I'm now going to recap an event that's recorded, which means I'm, I, I can't possibly be right. <laughs> okay. You know what I mean? Someone's going to listen to that and be like, that's not what you said at all. You know? Uh-huh. But I believe I said something to the effect, for the people who are too lazy to go listen to it, to the effect of Ghostbusters, which I think was popular or whatever. And you were skeptical about it. You said, you know what? I don't really know if that was popular when it came out. I think it could have been popular you know, when it made its way to DVD or yeah. cult hit or yeah. whatever, like so many of the things sure. we talk about on the show. Uh huh. This really upset people everybody, for some reason. Did everybody, it, so apparently it was really popular when it came out? Is that Not only was it popular for, you know, when it came out in the theater, but also you're an idiot. Oh. So say the emails. So I just wanted to, <laughs> Okay. I, I mean, I'm just delivering the message, man. Didn't I don't it come know out when I was it. one year old? So... <laughs> <laughs> Also, you have no right to have a show on the internet. I mean, I just want... And uh, I'm unsubscribing as well. All right. And uh, I would want my donation back. Here's what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring a one-year-old onto the show, and I'm going <laughs> to let people call in and just rip it apart. Just make fun of that one-year-old baby. Yeah. That's what I want to see right now. I mean, we were trying to be skeptical on the show. We didn't have the information. We asked some questions. We go, you know what? Was Ghostbusters popular? I don't know. Is that just a thing we commonly think? Apparently it was. So say people email. Whatever. So it was popular. Great. Good for Ghostbusters. I'm glad everybody likes Ghostbusters. They got very upset by this. I like when movies are popular. I just am (laughs) skeptical to believe all movies are popular when they come out. Look at fucking Rocky Horror Picture Show, right? Yeah, sure. And that's more, uh, I think, the type of movie. You know, I used to resist that. I used to be like, we cover all types of movies. But most of the movies we cover are either never popular or popular 65 years after they came out in theater. I'm not afraid to, but, you know, it's saturated. It's a saturated market to talk about Titanic. Yeah. It's right. a saturated market to talk about The Dark Knight. I don't know if it's a saturated market to just talk about the second tape of the two-tape set of Titanic, no, though. That, I think that not. could be a... Also, really open market is discussing freeway and nothing. Thank you. I was just going to force you to do that awkwardly without a segue and there you go i ruined it (laughs) anyways we're gonna spoil those two films and i'm gonna talk about chapters and now i'm talking about chapters and now you know there's chapters yeah so you can skip freeway and go to nothing because that's uh what comes after freeway or you can skip nothing and go to the end i'm sorry i'm not gonna be able to get through this without laughing all right so now that we've talked the reason i talk about chapters every time is because I assume that no one listens from week to week. That every single week we purge our entire listener base because you say something about <laughs> Ghostbusters. <laughs> and then no one's listening who was listening last week. Which is good that I told them about Ghostbusters, so now the new people can get upset right. and they can chapter over this. Why don't we just start that at the beginning of, of their every life episode? That I've- At the beginning of every podcast, we should be like, also, once upon a time, we didn't know whether or not Ghostbusters was popular. So feel free to stop listening now or chapter over. All right. So Freeway is going to be first. It is first. And I think Freeway is, it's really to contrast it to the mainstream, the Titanics of the film world. (laughs) I think uh, Freeway is a perfect fucking thing for us. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a million things going on at once. And I feel like when you watch it, especially now... You're not really sure what the hell it's doing. Yeah. It's just this crazy weird movie and it's not, it doesn't look like it's trying to be weird at all. Right. Well, what was that? Um, It reminds me really heavily, 
probably obviously of that Nicole Kidman movie we did whose name I can't remember to die for yes yeah sure I mean obviously there's the Elfman connection but other than yeah. that I think there's just a lot of and who is that Dan um, Dan Hadia I think who plays the detective yeah. in this yeah I think he was in to die for as well wasn't he yeah he was so I think that freeway is one of those films that really knows what's going on with itself and forgets to let the rest of the audience in sure but i think that's what works yeah i think when you see freeway now i mean for me you have this robert crumb opening credits thing you have the little red riding hood thing and we talked about uh i think we talked about robert crumb we talked about fritz the cat but i don't remember why uh super bisto right yeah wasn't that the idea? I think so, yeah. Subversive cartoon uh, type of idea. Uh huh. And I feel like the stuff we did for Super Bisto is, for me, what informed Freeway. To think about Robert Crumb writing Little Red Riding Hood, doing the cartoon for Little Red Riding sure. Hood. Sure. Okay, now we have, um, we have kind of a trashy 90s retelling of this story. Mm -hmm. And having that inform everything else that goes on, I can kind of you know, shoehorn it into that narrative if I have to. It helps right. it make a lot more sense for why is this movie so weird? What's happening here? Yeah. But also I think, you know, I always forget it's the Danny Elfman score until it starts. Right. I mean, that's weird too, isn't it? He had a kind of strange period in the in the late eighties when To Die For came out. Or maybe that was the nineties. I think it was ninety four. Yeah. Um well, then I guess oh no, the late eighties was when Oingo Boingo was breaking up. But this was still before he started doing the bigger score stuff. I mean, I'm talking Spider Man. Yeah. Not right. Batman. Spider Man was after the eighties and the nineties. So <laughs> somewhere in that period before yeah. Spider Man. All time from now on will be known as before Spider Man and after <laughs> Spider Man. So he did these scores that had uh instrumentation that wasn't always typical of you know movie scores yeah right i mean i'm going specifically to die for because that was the one with the fucking scary guitars and shit sure um but it still feels the same in this one yeah it's i think that's probably a, one of the biggest parallels with to die for is the score that yeah i don't want to call it out of place but it became in place because of Danny Elfman, right? <laughs> because of these films that were coming out at the time. Yeah. This is a real rarity for him because this is still that choir era, yeah. but it's the choir era and it's not Burton. I think that alone makes it yeah. a rarity because we have a Beetlejuice or an Edward Scissorhands type score for a movie that's not Tim Burton-esque at right. all. There's nothing Tim Burton about this yeah, film. Yeah, not even a little. But it's also distinct in having those guitar sounds and those sounds... You know, the stuff that uh, separated this and To Die For and a few of these other uh, films and TV work he was doing from the Tim Burton stuff. Right. Just a way to kind of go, okay, this is what my work feels like outside of a Tim Burton movie. Well, this is what my work feels like inside of Oingo Boingo. Is, uh... <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I guess somehow growing out of Oingo Boingo and really uh, making the trans the post Spider Man transformation. Right. Let's say. Yeah. God, I hate that. That's a line in the sand we've drawn. Uh, Matthew Bright is the director of this. Uh, Matthew Bright calls his movie an art exploitation film, which I thought you would enjoy. I do really enjoy that. It uh, sounds like something we made up. Yes. Um, I just wanted to point out that other people take words and add exploitation <laughs> to the end. That's not just. <laughs> It's not just mech exploitation and car exploitation. Do you know? So uh, let's have another moment of Ghostbusters ignorance oh, here God. for people to write in about Matthew Bright and Oingo Boingo. Do you know what was going on there? I don't. Was he in Oingo Boingo? Was it the early Oingo Boingo? You know, I don't think he was in Oingo Boingo. I know he because Oingo Boingo was something before it was Oingo Boingo, wasn't it? It was well, Oingo Boingo when it began was originally the Mystic Knights of the Oingo Boingo, which That's was it, which sure. was a weird. It was kind of like a reality band. They um. <laughs> okay, so here we go. We're gonna tie some double feature shit together. Remember when we did Confessions of a Dangerous Mind? Absolutely. Mystic Knights of the Oingo Boingo was a regular on the Gong show ah it's all coming together and uh from there they became a real band and they just dropped <laughs> okay, the sure. mystic knights of the and became oingo boingo um but the uh i have a feeling he knew those guys from back then because i know yeah. he grew up with richard elfman and with danny elfman right yeah but uh, he was never actually in the band or uh, sure I mean, he probably got comped into their shows he was that guy we talked about on scott pilgrim that is always just around young your band neil. but isn't yeah. really yeah isn't really in the band he was the young neil of oingo boingo 
Because Matthew Bright also was the writer for uh, Forbidden Zone. Which Richard Elfman directed. Richard Elfman directed, Danny Elfman worked on. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, for someone who's completely new to directing with this movie, yeah, there's a lot of things that are pretty ambitious, maybe out of ignorance, to be honest. I, I think uh, Matthew Bright would probably agree with us on that. But things like, you know, these driving scenes they're doing. Yeah. I mean, they're really in a car. Right. It's the hardest fucking way to do that. <laughs> yeah, but it's you also, know? believe it or not, Eric, it's the way to make it look the best. It's in the camera you can't If you're going to have, actually, I would argue that the other option is to do what they do in Natural Born Killers. But, I mean, we all know that that's going to be my favorite option anyway. Sure. Where they sure. put them in a car and then project old 1920s footage of cars driving behind sure. them. Sure. We saw that on uh, Pulp Fiction yeah. as well. Yeah, that kind of stuff. I mean, if, if you're going to fake somebody being in a car... Go all the way. Yeah, embrace it. I think that's that's something we talk about on Double Feature all the time, is if, if your shit's going to look like shit, make it look like shit on purpose. Yeah, right. Um, so they go the other way, where you right. know, you're driving and your director has to be in another car watching you act out yeah. scenes. The actors are responsible for a lot of stuff on their own. I don't know, you know, they pulled the a windshield out or something. I don't, I'm not exactly sure what the rig looks like. Right. You know, there's so many different ways we've come up with to shoot a driving mm-hmm. scene because there's such colossal pains in the ass. And Freeway does it by having actors in a car. Yeah. It's kind of emblematic of the level of gorilla type grit that the film maintains throughout the whole movie. Sure. Like I said, the film knows what it's doing. It's going mm-hmm. really hard to make it this movie that it knows it is. Mm-hmm. And stuff like the driving is what probably gets overlooked by the average viewer. You're talking about something like authenticity. Yeah. Well, I'm talking, I guess what I'm talking about is art exploitation, is what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay. All right. Sure. There's another shot, too. Uh, there's a really long take of them talking when they take a break from driving. I mean, I guess I feel like that whole, the whole portion in the beginning of the movie, all of the, uh, the freeway stuff and, you know, getting in and out of the car, that's just chalked full of stuff that kind of screams first time director trying a bunch of scary, risky yeah. things. And I think uh, really in almost every single case, in every case I can think of, they pay off. Yeah. But then there's some promise guarantees like these actors. You, uh, you mentioned this last week. Um, there's so many different people in this movie. There really so many yeah. bizarre different people. Yeah. Uh, Amanda Plummer is in this film, right? I think probably most recognizable for Pulp Fiction. Yeah. Is that fair? I or? think I definitely think Pulp Fiction is at least on our show. Those are the only films I'm going to consider have ever been created. I think on our show we've done more Amanda Plummer movies than there even are <laughs> because she was in Million Dollar Hotel. She's in The Prophecy. There's a, a couple of those actors that have, I mean, all of these guys, maybe we've just done too many movies at this point. I think all of these guys have been on our show at some point. Yeah. Um, there's the actress that plays Mrs. Sheets. She was in Edward Scissorhands. Yeah. And then Dan, I mentioned, who is also in Mall and Drive, and I think he's in yeah. Clueless. He's, he's a cop. He's always a fucking cop. Except when he was Nixon. Did you ever see Nixon? Really? Let's talk about a movie that's not on Double Feature for a second. Uh, Oliver Stone uh, did this movie called Nixon. I think it was about the same time that this was going on. Oliver Stone served as an executive producer for this movie. I think that's probably how a lot of these uh, these actors were landed yeah. for the film. But uh, yeah, he cast him in Nixon, and I think he was also the one who helped cast Kiefer Sutherland. Huh. Kiefer Sutherland we saw in Dark City, and I um, I think I was watching 24 a lot at some point while we were doing the show. But really well known for that. You want to talk about television. And I feel like he brings it in this movie too. He's almost too good. Like I believe that he is a counselor at a school for boys. Yeah. Every time I watch this movie, I refuse to believe he's a killer. He's really endearing and really sincere when he needs to be. But he's yeah. fucking evil and disgusting when he becomes that. There's no reason to ever really feel bad bad for him or to get behind him right i do just because he's good (laughs) it's not until he starts whispering you're gonna have to let me in that i go oh yeah wait kill he actually talks me back out of it yeah (laughs) they get back in the car maybe there's just some safety about the car i don't know It, it shouldn't be that's where the danger is but uh he talks me right back out of thinking he's a psychopath 
And that's not even his biggest sell in the movie. Right. He lives through getting shot. Yeah. Um, with the quote, <laughs> a whole bunch of times, yeah. I believe. Yeah. Uh, and then spends the rest of the movie, you know, as the monster who was resurrected too many yeah. times. That's his big sell in the film. I think that his other strength as a character, or at least maybe in the writing, is that Vanessa is such a weak her background make paints her as such a weak character sure and such a sheltered character that she gets upset about something that you and i might give somebody the benefit of the doubt for like what kind of thing well i mean so she's in the car and he starts saying some creepy stuff and she's all defensive about it and oh you yeah and immediately I, you and i might just be like chill out he's you know he's just trying to be a psychotherapist or whatever sure like, sure calm down you're not aware of what psychotherapy is so perhaps let the world happen to you yeah and it's not until he's you know halfway up her pants until he's doing sex to her dead body right doing sex to her dead body i love that it's, too yeah it's not until then that i you want to do sex to my dead body <laughs> but that i mean that that is a perfect encapsulation of what i'm saying is she is so naive and sheltered that i'm always tempted to side with Kiefer sutherland's character mm -hmm. because he seems more worldly and more no listen listen darling you're not you don't even know what the world is like yeah for sure you're overreacting to something you've never experienced yeah, Vanessa's character is a really interesting one too. She has this uh this knack for breaking things down to their basest components. Right. That it might make her look simple. I mean, when we're introduced to her, we find out she's illiterate. That's the first thing we learn about her. Yeah. And this is an actress that, you know, you want to talk about the movie in retrospect. This was before she did Legally Blonde. Yeah, this was before she was the poster child for Dumb. Yeah, right. And it's a it's a movie that sandwiched, I mean, I guess it's like a year after Clueless came out. Sure. And so it's probably fitting into a part of people's brains that that's tapped into at least a little bit. I, I don't know why I always think about Clueless when I watch this movie. That's always there a little bit, even though there aren't really a lot of connections to that. That's weird. You think Clueless, I think Gummo. Yeah. <laughs> well, I could see a lot of that, too. That's probably where my mind should go. It's just, it's a little too fun and a little too accessible, I think. Oh, maybe you that's didn't think what... Gummo was fun and accessible? You need to rewatch that. There's something I love about her character. I mean, she's so juvenile, and she just, she can't not be herself, you know? Right. She's in court and she's heckle. You got beat with an ugly stick. I mean, just yeah. no control, no idea. Hey, I should tone it down right. here because I'm in court. Yeah, and that's kind of that's kind of another turning point for me as getting to know and like Vanessa mm -hmm. is when her kind of naivety turns into her being a strong person and she doesn't know any better, but she's in a situation where not knowing any better makes her authentic. And right, makes yeah. her, you know, a strong person. Well, we see her defend herself really well. Yeah. And that's, that almost comes as a surprise because of how, I guess, illiterate. I'll just keep using the word illiterate she is. You know, we yeah. assume she's really an underdog here. And she is. She's the victim. But when the uh, the freeway portion of the film, which ends surprisingly quickly it, it's, for it, a movie called Freeway. Yeah, I mean, there's another exploitation right there, title exploitation. Yeah, totally, totally. So, you know, pulls the gun on him, gets the upper hand. This isn't going to be a story about, it's not even so much rape revenge. You want no. to talk about exploitation. I mean, she's, she's all over this situation. She knows how, she comes from a slum. She knows how to defend herself and uh, shoots him a million times. And then the, the headgear comes right. out. Well, then John Waters is where it goes from there. <laughs> sure. It goes as if it wasn't already. It goes there. to serial mom from there. The headgear and the mouth and the shed of pornography. And that's how you know he's a killer, by the way. Yeah, porn shed. Nobody, that's the thing that's the most upsetting about Freeway for me, the most bizarre, is that no one is convinced he's a killer until they open up a shed and he has some barely legals. Yeah. And suddenly, well, it's all been revealed now. Yeah. Now we finally understand. <laughs> Um, but, you know, the police don't believe her, and that just drives me nuts, the fact that they're antagonistic for seemingly no reason. Yeah. Um, well, just... it's because, again, they know better, and she's a punk. Sure. That's the kind of, um, I mean, I know I keep going back to it, but her character makes it very difficult to be on her side. Not a reliable uh, witness. When you first get to know her. 
Yeah, exactly. And so these cops are all, yeah, yeah, I'm sure that really happened. Yeah, I bet. And that just pisses her off. And so then then she just becomes irate and absolutely inconsolable. And then there's no reason to be on her side because she's dangerous. Uh, well, Kiefer Sutherland knocked out her grandma and stole her uh, her shower cap. I mean, that's <laughs> that's a pretty good reason to be on her side. That's true. I mean, if the headgear in the mouth wasn't enough, then you have uh, Kiefer Sutherland dressed up as someone's grandma to really, yeah. you know, really seal in the Red Riding Hood. Yeah. Do you feel like that's that's kind of a point where the uh, the Red Riding Hood aspect of the film jumps the shark? <laughs> she starts in a, a red jacket with a basket. Yeah. She chooses to run away from home with a basket. I mean, so no, what you're saying is you're saying is that that it jumps the shark right at the beginning. And so by the end, it's it's, you know, doing aerial backflips over giant, giant whale sharks. We're finding this out over and over. The answer to I want to get away with something in the film is do it in the first frame. Yeah, no, that's do the- it in the first fucking frame. And then, I mean, what's the audience going to say? Yeah. You know, they could have turned around and left. They didn't go through the whole movie and then find out he was going to dress up as grandma. Right. They got a fucking Robert Crumb sequence in the beginning. It's true. They know what's coming. Hey, here's a segue for you. Speaking of knowing what's coming, can we talk about the sequel to Freeway? Oh, God. This is the thing I want to say about the sequel. And you can just, you know, tell me where I'm at on this Uh because I don't know. The sequel to Freeway, it's called Freeway 2. um, Confessions of a Trick Baby. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. I have it written down. Oh, that's good. It looks like the American Psycho 2 type of, you know, the the studio uh, Grease 2. Studio has the rights to something. They want to cash in on those rights. So they just tack a 2 on the end of something that's clearly, you know. Troll 2. I I wasn't (laughs) going to go there. But yeah, I mean, clearly a, you know, here was a big event and we're going to make Pulp Fiction 2 uh, without any, you know, without the, and then the director releases what today I guess is an angry blog post or some kind of statement. Right. I had nothing to do with S. Darko, a Donnie Darko tale. I don't know what the studio's making these terrible movies. But uh, Matthew Bright wrote and directed. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's his movie. I don't, I don't know anything about it. Sure. Which is, as we're also finding, the best thing to talk about on our show is things we don't know about. I mean, I honestly don't even know to what extent it actually exists. Um, Neither of us have seen it. Is I know, it real? I, well, it's I, know real there's right? a, I know there's a poster, and I know you can buy VHSs on Amazon for $50. All right, then it's clearly real. Well, or it could just be Matthew Bright having it's an Amazon dailies. account. Yeah. <laughs> sure. I mean, it could be Sleepaway Camp 4. All right, time to talk about a different movie. <laughs> That's uh, clearly... Yeah, let's talk about nothing. This is a really excellent opening for you because I don't think a movie has ever more blatantly lied about the this is 100% true. Oh we my totally God. mean it. I fucking love it. This really happened every yeah. single word of it. Yeah. This takes the Fargo thing and the spun thing and just puts it exactly where I want it to be. Yeah, sure. Fargo was the based on a true story and spun is based on the truth and lies, which I think at the time we both agreed every film should be preceded with. Sure. But yeah, nothing goes ahead and says this is absolutely true. Everything, every bit of this happened. And the best part about it is if you know that these are from the guys that made Cube, Mm -hmm. it's just waiting for the moment that you can, (laughs) I guess, just start cracking up at the fact that this is reality. Sure. But, and here's the weird part, and I don't know if you thought about it. Nobody can actually prove it never happened. (laughs) Thanks for that. (laughs) Yeah. Uh Except the cops that watch the house disappear. I'm not even going to touch that. Uh, we get another animated intro, and it sets up this story of best friends. Yeah. So, th- I mean, this could be rooted in some reality. We're using the same names as the actors and so forth. Sure. Uh, this is a great little sequence, too. You get this uh, these cutout y kind of, there's crayons and a retro arcade scene. And yeah. this is another fine example of the beginning is where you put your hard cells. Mm-hmm. This is all exposition. Yeah. I mean, you'll, you will uh, basically tolerate any amount of exposition in the beginning of a movie. Sure. Before the title. Yeah. I mean, I all, mean, if science fiction films all the time will literally just write a fucking paragraph and tell you yeah. in the year 2063 after nuclear fallout, when dogs have overrun the earth and man is like, right. you know what I mean? And you just go, Oh, okay. Well, it's fucking star Wars. 
Sure, that's it's, also it's true. It's the the fucking Star Wars thing where George Lucas had to what drop out of the director's guild because he wanted to put text before the fucking credits or whatever. I didn't know that. Is that true? Yeah, I I've heard. I now okay. I now I feel I'm so pissed off because I feel like I need to cite all my fucking sources now. Well, I'd um, also like to point out that you can stop because you've mentioned officially mentioned Star Wars more times than MythBusters this season. Oh, so if you'd like to just bail on this line of <laughs> line of thought. Yeah, we'll just no, but I I am curious though. So you've heard that I've that's... heard I've heard that he had to drop out of the director's guild because he didn't want to start the film with credits. I thought he dropped out of the director's guild because he wanted to make Sin City with Robert Rodriguez. Let me say really quick though that I love George Lucas because he sold Star Wars and gave all his money away. That's really the only thing I need to say about George Lucas. Way to go, George Lucas. So we're we're still in a science fiction film here. Oh yeah, it's a really interesting concept too because I think a lot of science fiction is about the world implications of a device sure you know we look at uh, the matrix uh-huh. um, we did the matrix on the show this that, is, that's a great parallel for this movie too yeah you one simple thing and how it's affecting it it's a story about neo and how he's being presented the truth about the world and it changes what you think about the entire world right well and it unfolds backwards I mean, you are you are immersed in the idea and then you have to figure out how it works, why it works and what the use of that is. So if sci fi is set in our world, we even have to do that with superhero films Mm -hmm. like Spider-Man. You know, yeah, they have to go. Well, if Spider-Man is a real thing, here's how he exists in your world. The audience demands to know how there could be. How does Christopher Nolan make Batman realistic? Because he has to live in our world. Uh huh. And I think the other thing a lot of science fiction does is it just tries to brush under the rug, ignoring the implications on the world that this would have. Right. You know, if this person was real, if this power was real, how would society even exist? Right. Nothing is a movie that doesn't attempt to do either of those things. It doesn't care at all about that. No. It really just lets you focus on the characters. You know, it's, it's creating a world that only, by definition, involves these two people so it doesn't really matter. We don't have to sweep it under the rug, and we don't have to figure out what it does to the world. We just get beyond that, and then you know we we really do get to have a movie that's just about these. I don't think the concept gets in the way of the characters at all. No, I think that I think that the thing about the troop of people that make this film and make Cube is that they approach science fiction from a very different place than mm-hmm. than somebody like the Wachowskis did with The Matrix. Nothing and Cube, I mean, more so nothing, are films where instead of bending the world into an interesting scientific way to peak your brain, it's creating a situation that forces stress on characters and causes them to develop in ways they never wanted to. Interesting. Um, yeah, I guess that was true of Cube as well. It, it puts these characters who all have very deep character bases in situations where those would never have to come out right unless this were happening sure um cube i mean is it's a little bit more in the in the horror sense of everything but i think this film basically it straight up takes these two guys strips the world away and goes how do you function when there is no world and you have the power to take away anything you bounce up and down and play a bunch of games. I fucking love it. That's, <laughs> that's the answer. I fucking love it. Yeah, I, to contrast it to Cube, too, being a lot more horror. Oh, this yeah. is uh, It's a very lighthearted movie. The yeah. white space is very... Also funny to think about The Matrix, another movie. We, we've never really talked about infinite white space, have we? Uh, you know, five years, probably. But let's say no. So it's bouncy, which is something you didn't know no. about Infinite White Space, yeah. but you've never seen someone jump on it. Apparently it's bouncy. That's it's, true. It's not like tofu, though. No. And I do want to point that out, <laughs> because while our characters don't eat a lot of tofu, I've jumped on many a cube of tofu, Michael. And let me tell you, <laughs> I don't know. Infinite White Space is done. It's an interesting thing you can do at home yeah. if you have video editing software. That's really the trick to make it or great. Or seasons one through eight of bullshit. That's my favorite use of it. Oh, God, I love that. Just no reason to yeah, do it. Just, right? it's, Just to class up the joint. That's why bullshit is science fiction. <laughs> Penn and Teller exist only in my mind, which is probably a rightful domain for them. Um, infinite white space is done by you have a white floor and a white wall. And that's really your basic. I mean, you're in a white room as far as where the camera can see. That's the basic piece you need. 
you can make it appear more professional by making the um, I'm making diagrams no one can see with my hands. The seam between the floor and the wall. Sure. If you can make that seam disappear by rounding it. Yeah. So, you know, some kind of big piece of white tape that's uh, taped, let's say, 10 feet in front of where the wall starts uh -huh. and then taped onto the physical wall. Yeah. So that your camera doesn't see that sort of dark line of where the wall and the floor meet. Sure. And then you light it in such a way that, you know, you're really, really exposing the wall and the floor to make them so bright you can't see the detail of uh -huh. the texture of those things. And then if you really want to finesse it, you bring it into software like Final Cut and you just blow out the very highlights enough that you get rid of the vi you make sure it's the purest white that it could possibly be mm -hmm. that you can see no detail it's as blown out as possible but if you've ever seen you know sort of behind the scenes or rough footage from something uh like bullshit that's a really good example look that up it's probably on youtube or something um outtakes from bullshit you'll notice it before color correction and you can get a more real sense of what they're actually doing there in the day, which is just sure. standing around a, a white room before color correction. So many of the effects in this movie are audio based though. I mean, once you've proven that you can make something disappear, you don't really need to rely on that anymore. Yeah. You know, you could just reference it. You made the clock disappear with the sound and later you can just play that sound and people will go, Oh yeah, they've, there were a lot of effects in that movie. They sure. made a lot of stuff disappear. Right. And I love that. That's a great, you know, do it yourself kind of gimmick too. They vanish memories, which they, right. it's not even, I mean, when they're standing outside the house claiming things have vanished, that's one thing, but to vanish memories, they couldn't even show that. Right. So the characters just make a squinty face. You play the sound and not for a second do you right. realize that they aren't really doing an effect. They're doing nothing right now. They're just playing a yeah. sound. Well, you go back and you think about it and I mean, even you might even think about it like, yeah, and I remember seeing all these memories just going through and disappearing. Sure, sure. You don't see shit. You never see anything. No, you don't see anything. They're acting really hard. and yeah. <laughs> They're making the mind beam face. It's right. The, the scene, um, one of the, what, 150 scenes where they're furious at each other. Sure, sure. Where they're standing outside the house and um, I don't remember exactly if it, I think it's a, what, a bedside table or a dresser or something. Sure. That they make disappear and then you hear the lamp break. Oh, yeah, for sure. That kind of stuff. Insult to injury, make the lamp vanish. The stuff like that, that is where the infinite white space forces you to imagine a lot more. Yeah, sure. And so by that point, you're visualizing all this stuff that isn't even really happening. Well, and this is, uh, our characters have gotten to such an extreme point by now that we're, we're I want to say pretty immersed. I mean, I don't know how uniform this is for everybody else. When I watch this movie, I'm so immersed in the story of these two characters that I'm just, you know, I'm buying the things they're trying to, okay, you made a lamp vanish. Of course you did. Yeah. You know, I'm completely immersed in this fight they're having. And this is a long way. These, you know, these are characters that start with social anxieties. Mm -hmm. um, sometime we should tell the story of Gary. I feel like that's oh, very, yeah. yeah. I, this is probably not the right time for no. that, but if you ever meet us in person, that's all you have to do. You have yep. a conversation starter right now. Yeah. Ask us about Gary. Yep. But I'll now reveal the story on accident. <laughs> but the sound of someone knocking, yeah. <laughs> there you go, is just awful. Or, or like the sound of their buzzer. Their sure. home is being invaded. Sure. That's a sound for me too. I mean, maybe I identify a lot with these characters, but just uh, every time you hear that buzzer, it's, it's fucking Pavlovian conditioning, you know? Yeah. And rightfully so. I mean, every time the buzzer rings, something awful is at the door. Yep. These are characters that, I mean, one of which refuses to even leave the house, but they don't like the outside world. Sure. And sure enough, when the outside, what do they know about the outside world? They know little it girl's sucks. mom. Yeah. They know tearing down the house. They know the police are coming in to get them. Sure. It seems like a pretty awful world out there. Yeah. Well, also, the other thing that that represents that I think is really interesting from a from a uh, storytelling standpoint, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm going to try really hard not to make a groaning pun here, uh -oh. but this film takes place after the climax of a film. This film goes, so you know how you watch a movie and all the stuff kind of comes to a head and culminates and you pretty much see these people's lives ruined and that's how things end. This is what happens after that. Nothing, nothing happens sure, after that. Sure. Right. Uh, it's, it's kind of a weird illustration of you take 
the point where the film would otherwise end, where you realize that these people do not function in a normal society well enough to fucking survive. To be in that normal society. Right. Yeah, this and, perfect place they've built crumbles apart, you know, because one of the characters gets swindled by this girl he likes. Yeah. You know, and that's all it takes for their perfect little existence to come crumbling down. And so this lets us tell a totally different story. We don't want to tell a story about how the character was swindled. Mm -hmm. We want to tell a story about the mental fallout he has after that, that the, right. both of these characters have. Mm -hmm. And that's a completely, I mean, then we don't have to deal with the anxiety as an audience as much. Right. We get to play around in that, you know, the way they adventure immediately after that, the, uh, the childlike innocence of that, the tinfoil homemade gear. And mm -hmm. one character is all in red. The other's all in blue. They have a samurai sword. Yeah. They have a fucking pillow fight. You know what I mean? It's just this kind of things are very simple in their minds. Yeah. They want to go to a happy place. Yeah. After all of the, the terror that's existing there. That's an interesting thing. We don't talk about a lot as far as escapism in films, but sometimes, uh, things are going shitty in your life and you lose your job because your girlfriend steals all your money. And I don't know, you just want to get away from that place. And a film like Nothing is not only about that, but it allows the audience to do that too. It goes, well, let's have a lighthearted film that can get your mind off things. It can, you know, it's going to be about these two characters. It's going to be a, a little goofy. And anything you learn in that process is still done in a pretty lighthearted way. Right. You know, we're seeing that we can identify immediately. These characters live in the real world. They have problems that maybe the audience identifies with. Mm -hmm. And then it just all stops. It all goes away and it lets them kind of mentally deal with that. Yeah, but that also ends up bringing up these problems that they, again, like I said, wouldn't have had to face before about, you know, the depths of their relationship with each other and what they really need to be happy. And at the end of the day, it turns out that what they need to be happy is heads. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, I'm not even sure the answer to the question. Right. But bringing those things up makes it more than escapism, too. It's a level beyond that. We talked about My Neighbor Totoro being mm -hmm. this kind of fantasy world that you just play in and there's no villains and, you know, you just, it's a retreat. But this isn't solely a retreat. It does kind of start, especially towards the end, to invite you back into reality. To say, would it really be so good if you could just make all these things vanish? Right. You know, they, uh, they deal with a lot of serious concepts, too, in just as far enough to get the audience working on them. Things like isolationism. Yeah. Or blocking out bad memories. Yeah. You know, the, the memories he blocks out, his parents making him wear a dress or putting his head in the oven... And they're all treated with this Pee Wee Herman kind of sensibility. Right. And they start slowly with that. They start with hating away the fact you're a poor artist. Sure. And let's, you know, let's test this mechanic. And I mean, I think about that and I immediately go, well, that's a great idea. If I could just, here we are back in the Matrix conversation. Uh -huh. If I could just believe I was a great artist, I mean, that would be fantastic. Yeah, I'll right. take that. But it's different than that. It's, it's not caring that you're a bad artist. I sure. Think. <laughs> well, and in practice, I mean, that's probably not a great idea. No. You're going to make more art, but it's you're going to have less inhibitions, I guess. Sure. But you might never find what you're good exactly. at. Exactly. That's you know? the thing is is I think that part of the strength of being a person and and not having the ability to forget things about yourself that you don't like mm -hmm. is that if you can just choo pick and choose what about you you accept, mm -hmm. at the end of the day you're never going to realize what makes you happy and, and what kind of a purpose your life can lead. Sure. Think about it in terms of longevity. You think about when you're five, you want to be, you know, an astronaut. And then when you're 10, you want to be a fireman and et cetera, et cetera. And if at any point you just forget that you can't be that, you're going to want to be an astronaut your whole life. Sure. And I removing mean, outliers, none of those people become astronauts. Yeah, nobody ever becomes an astronaut. So what do they do? They throw away their lives, you know? Well, and then, and, and, you know, there are people who will say, you know, believe in your dreams. You can be anything you want. Well, what happens when you're 80 and you can't? <laughs> sure. I mean, sure. at what point do you throw your hands up and go, whoops, failed that life. <laughs> right. I'll get it better next time. Not so much. You fucking blew it. So it's good to know when you're, when you're blowing it. I mean, it's good to be able to, to sense that. It's not just life dreams, though. I mean, right. they're doing that with all facets of 
I, Andrew hates away the memory and that gives him self-confidence and we get to toy with that idea. If you could just forget certain memories, leave them in the past, would that be for better or for worse? And we're also seeing character development through the sci-fi mechanism too, which I like a lot about yeah. that. We see Andrew become more confident because of the mechanism. Mechanism's not just there to get asses in seats. Mm -hmm. It actually helps the character develop and it helps their relationship mm -hmm. develop as well. I mean, that's uh, the relationship is entirely responsible for steering the plot. Yeah. And so Andrew becoming more confident is kind of what starts this. They hate away being mad at each other. They hating away, actually hating away being mad at each other, which turns out is something you can actually do that right. you don't need a sci-fi power. You could just, yeah. uh, I believe, forgive and forget that's called. It allows you to have that exercise as well. Uh -huh. I mean, if you wanted to make this a metaphor, you could create your own metaphor about this. Uh, this is the, we're talking about the same thing people do with different forms of escapism, with chemical escape, with say with being drunk, right? Uh -huh. Life is bad. You hate it. You're having a rough time. You turn to alcohol. It helps you dull the pain. It helps you forget that you're a poor artist. Right. It helps you forget your fights. It helps you forget that you're a pedophile. <laughs> it helps you forget you're a pedophile. I guess. <laughs> After you say that would be a good point to uh, remind everyone we don't drink, and this is not oh, a right. not a yeah. self narrative. <laughs> <laughs> just you know, I just want to keep everybody on the same page. Very true. But so it's not just saying, okay, well, what if you had this power? Would this be a good idea? I mean, that's kind of a useless, a fun but useless errand. Until you start going, well, really, what we're talking about is just being able to forget things. And is it better to forget? Is it really better to undo and to regret and to say, man, I wish it wasn't like this, you know, and to have it another way. Right. And using this science fiction mechanism allows people to play that game in a, in a way maybe they haven't before. Um, yeah, we have a website. Uh, that would be, what is that? Doublefeatureshow.com. We still Doublefeatureshow.com. That's true. We can't get doublefeature.com. Still not happening. I added a cool thing to the site, okay. which will probably break it and I'll probably remove it at some point. Okay. But if you scroll down to the bottom of the page, it automatically loads content that Holy you would think shit. would be there. Yeah. It's a, what? it's an infinite scrolling. Some mad 2012 magic, man. Yeah, I know. It's, it's really, the site doesn't get updated as often as it should. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's more like mad 2010, I think. Yeah. I don't know when infinite scroll is invented. Not important. <laughs> what are we doing next time? Well, next time we are going to do Spy Kids 2 and Gremlins 2. It's about time we got back to that. I, um, yeah. I've wanted to see Gremlins 2 since we did Gremlins. What do we do uh, Gremlins with? Let's not talk about that this week because I suddenly remembered and I'm embarrassed and I hope uh -huh. people... Uh, I hope people forget by next week. Well, I, and I have some insights on Gremlins 2 because I actually got to see Joe Dante screen that bitch. Oh, awesome. Do you have any so, insights about Spy Kids 2? Um, I've seen Spy Kids 2 more times than I've seen Gremlins 2. Wasn't Spy Kids 2 the movie that got George Lucas kicked out of the Director's Guild? Watch more fucking film. Bye. <laughs>